So let's bring in Hollywood divorce attorney David Glass for more on this. David, people going through divorces are going through some of the hardest times of their lives, and a lot of what they're going through is emotional. And in any divorce, there's a huge sense of loss, and the loss of relationship, of money, some friends. David Glass here for another new episode of the Hourglass Podcast, where family law and psychology intersect. I'm a certified family law specialist, former psychologist, and the author of Moving On, Redesigning Your Emotional, Financial, and Social Life After Divorce. Our mission is to do all we can to help those going through a breakup or divorce find ways to make the trauma of it all a little bit easier to deal with, more understandable, smoother, and to help people find motivation and inspiration to move on. Today, we're going to talk about narcissism. In news media cycles, this topic seems to be one of the hottest these days. It continues to trend. Diana Shepard of Divorce Magazine told us in season one that those going through divorce or a breakup can't get enough articles on narcissism. Today, here's what we're going to learn. What narcissism is, dead giveaways that you're in the clutches of a narcissist, and how to communicate and deal with one. We're going to begin our discussion today with a highly skilled therapist, Claudia Sine Mosias from the San Francisco Bay Area. She has been a practicing psychologist since 1990. She was co-director of Park Presidio Counseling Center in San Francisco for 25 years, where she supervised interns, led trainings, and saw couples, groups, and individuals. She also served as a licensing examiner for the California Board of Behavioral Sciences. She has specialized in narcissism and its effects since the late 1990s. She also writes extensively on that topic on her website blog. She currently maintains a small private practice online and continues to write and speak about narcissistic abuse. I can't wait for her to tell us what she knows. Welcome, Claudia. Thanks so much for being with us today. Can you start off by just defining narcissism for us? So narcissism exists on a continuum. And I'm going to, I think that it's important to know that we go from healthy narcissism, which all of us need to be good at our profession, to uh, have confidence in how to raise our children, uh, to function in the world. Uh, and then we go to what is called narcissistic traits, where somebody might be a little selfish or monopolizing the conversation too much or speaking without a breath and never asking about you. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things are within the normal range. I think what we're talking about today is narcissistic personality disorder. And that's the most troubling on the spectrum. And narcissistic personality disorder goes all the way to sociopathic narcissism, where people commit crimes, uh, murders, robberies, and have no remorse about it. They just don't feel anything. So the personality disorder, which we're talking about today, is characterized by a complete lack of empathy. The other characteristic is an overwhelming need for admiration. And we see this in somebody being extremely self-involved. They have to always be right. And they're willing to uh, gaslight us, which is to make us think that we're wrong when we're not, in order to maintain that illusion that they're constantly right. The other thing that we look at in, in narcissism is grandiosity. Uh, somebody that might look like, um, look at me, I'm so attractive, I'm so smart. Um, it might be that I am the best. It might be that they don't settle for people around them being anything but the best. The narcissist personality sees themselves as exceptional. And they don't want to associate with anybody else who doesn't meet their criteria for exceptionality. So what this means is you either feel really unexceptional around them, you feel less than, you feel not good enough, um, or um, they don't have a lot of people around them. Right. Uh, it's important to note that narcissists can have what's called an empathy mask. And that is that they can turn on empathy for the benefit of the outside world. So example, if you're married to a narcissist and he, I'm gonna use the word he because mm -hmm. 60 to 75% of narcissists are male. That doesn't mean there aren't females, but they're right. predominantly male, um, will uh, be charming 
and entertaining. And then they'll come home and criticize their family relentlessly. So what happens there is that the, the family gets no sympathy from the outside world. Um, Gee, your dad is great. Oh, your husband, I wish I had one of those. But they don't know what's happening inside the family unit. And that's the, that's the empathy mask that they wear. And they can take that mask pretty much on and off at will. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to another point about the narcissist personality, and that is that they are interpersonally exploitive. And that's how they, they do this. They can use people, they can abuse people, and then present another face to the world, which doesn't look like exploitation at all. It looks like they're charming, they're intelligent, they're engaging. But they use, the exploitiveness has to do with making themselves feel, what do I wanna say here, real. Mm -hmm. To understand the narcissist in the deepest sense is to understand that they don't have a sense of self, which is ironic because they Right. So big and full of themselves. Mm -hmm. But that is a projection and a, and, a, and a false front. So they try very hard to get people to buy into their mask, to buy into their illusion, because they're terrified that they're going to be discovered that there's nobody home there. Right. So the underlying problem with them is it's, it's very sad. But I have to say, one of the characteristics of a narcissistic personality is they're not bothered by it. You know, right. it's, it's, not like, um, it's not like somebody who has anxiety or depression who may come to a counselor and say, gee, help me, I'm, I'm having panic attacks or I just don't feel like getting out of bed. The narcissist is not bothered by their condition. Everybody else is bothered by their condition. Right. Right, I remember learning in graduate school the difference between Axis I disorders, yes. depression, anxiety, uh, schizophrenia, and Axis II disorders or personality disorders, including narcissistic personality disorder, is that it, in the first, I'm using layman terms, in the first category, people feel they're crazy. In the second uh, category, they drive everyone around them crazy. That's exactly right. Maybe that's oversimplifying yes, it. Yes, but it's, it's true, yes. And so, um, what uh, is it possible for people to be diagnosed on more than one axis two disorder with more than one personality disorder? Yeah, it's quite it's quite possible, and it's it's often frequent, especially when you're looking at uh, what's called borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. They're kind of they're kind of bed partners, and often they appear in the same person. And if if they do appear in the same person, uh, you're in big trouble. Right. If, you're, if you're married to them or working for them or somehow associated with them. Because the borderline personality disorder is very combative. Narcissists aren't necessarily combative, at least in a way that, that is easily ascertainable. They're good at making us feel crazy because they present their arguments in a very logical way and right. sometimes very calming and very, very reasonable. And so we think, am I nuts? But the borderline... Um, uh, like I said, is, is more combative and their personality structure is a bit more unstable. So what you find with somebody who has both personality disorders is somebody that's really, really impossible to deal with. Right. Um, they don't get away with the success in the outer world as much uh, because their pathology is so obvious. Right. Um, but it's very, very difficult. I have some clients now who are dealing with uh, spouses who are both borderline and narcissistic. And so you get the, the gaslighting, the ghosting, the, the um, making you feel crazy, and you get the fights, you get the anger, you get the argument. Right, it's almost the, the perfect storm yes. of all the worst things yes. that a partner can be. Yes. Taking a step back, you mentioned that at the heart of the narcissist is that they, to use my words, they feel about this big inside. Mm -hmm. And so how does that lead them into this style of interacting with people? That's a very interesting and complex question. So when you feel like you don't really exist, that you have no validity, you, you, de you develop a defense system that's made up of this false persona. And that's to keep you from feeling empty. Right. And, and, and it works. Um, so that, you know, that's where it comes from. The, the narcissistic, there's, there's some interesting things about where 
narcissism comes from. For decades, clinicians have been treating narcissists as victims of child abuse or, or um, uh, trauma mm -hmm. in childhood or, or adulthood or adolescence. And that's not wrong. But what we found, there's some recent studies that um, have now been published about over 70 years of studies over multiple cultures and multiple countries and multiple un institutions studying these things that says that there's no correlation directly between child abuse or trauma and narcissistic personality. Hmm. The, again, that doesn't mean that they haven't been traumatized, but it's how the individual deals with the trauma right. that distinguishes. Most of us are resilient. Um, we can introspect. We can figure it out. We can problem solve, and we can ask for help, and that's how we can. Therefore, we can resolve our our childhood traumas. But the narcissist instead builds this false persona behind which he hides. And as long as the persona is this grandiosity, you're not going to say, "Help me! Right. I feel empty." Mm -hmm. You're not going to feel that emptiness. Right. So, why is it that people are so often attracted? to narcissists and why do they get caught up in these relationships until they find themselves knee deep in it and, and have trouble getting out? Yeah, um, a lot of narcissists were raised by narcissists. And um, kind of two things, this is, this is going off, and maybe we'll talk about this later, that there's two paths that happen most often when you were raised by a narcissist. You either become a codependent counter-narcissist or you become a narcissist yourself. So if you become a counter-narcissist, you were raised by a narcissist and you never got that love that you needed, mm -hmm. you think, it's something I did. If I could only have been a better child, if I could only have been a better student, if I could only have been a better wife, then this wouldn't have happened. So you, you do what we call um, the compulsion to repeat. You go out and you find somebody that's similar to dad mm -hmm. or to mom, and you think, if I'm just good enough for them, right. I can change them. Now, this is not conscious. Nobody goes out and says, right. I'm going to find my abusive, neglective parent. Yeah. But we're attracted to that. And so I, I think that's how, about how that happens. Right. And so um, how does the victim, uh, to use that term loosely, play into the uh, the narcissist game when they're in a relationship? Do they have any role in the game or is it, or is this just something being put on them? No, they have a, they have a role in the game. They, they do the, they do the dance and the dance is, it's my fault. The narcissist is saying it's your fault. Mm -hmm. And the counter narcissist is saying, you're right. It is. Uh, the narcissist is saying black is white and the counter narcissist is saying, maybe that's true. Um, so you become very codependent to the narcissist's behavior because right. you want their love. You want mm -hmm. their approval. Yeah. And the narcissist is betting that you want their approval more than you want your own sense of self. And so the game perpetuates itself. And so what kinds of things does a narcissist say? What, what, are, what are some of their taglines that are going to jump out at you? I, as a divorce lawyer, I've interviewed people to be potential clients. And I've had people tell me, I could do this case myself and I understand exactly what the judge needs to hear, but I'm gonna let you represent me. And that's when I try to get off the phone with them. I just don't wanna deal with that person as a divorce client. But what are some other taglines that you're gonna hear to maybe tip you off on dealing with someone who's narcissistic or going full blown into access to diagnosis? Well. So I don't get a lot of people calling me who are a narcissist and say, help me, I'm a narcissist right. for reasons that I've, I've mentioned before. When I have seen narcissists, it's almost exclusively as part of a couple. The couple will come in because right. they're having trouble in their marriage. And what the giveaway is for me that somebody might be a narcissist is they come in with, this has nothing to do with me. Right. You need to fix her. She obviously is not understanding me, and I'm so glad we're here so that you can make her right. Right, right. And then at some point, uh, if you start, if they're coming into you in couples therapy and you've got a narcissist, at some point do they bail out because you're starting to get, you're starting to focus the attention on them? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Uh, couples therapy with narcissists doesn't usually last long. And in my experience, what's happened, you, you go three, four sessions, and then the narcissist says, it, you're not a good therapist. You're obviously siding with her. We're stopping. This is not helping. Then, if I'm lucky in terms of getting to do my work, the remaining partner will come in for individual work. Right. And then you can start working with them. Yes. To, to try and get past this narcissist, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. The, the other thing that I think is important to understand in divorcing uh, narcissistic couples, if there's children involved, is there's a lot of false accusations of abusing the children. Um, sometimes the uh, narcissist is abused, especially if it's that borderline narcissistic personality where, where they can get very angry and, and violent even. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it will be, you know, he said, she said kind of situation. And even, in, even if the child comes home and says, you know, mommy, daddy was out all night, uh, the, the narcissist will, will deny it. And he'll keep denying it and doubling down and doubling down until pretty soon mom thinks maybe the child is lying. Right. Um, so with children, uh, I look for a lot of accusations about... Uh, she's ruining the kids. She's turning them against me. A reasonable person who wants the best for her children is going to say, let's work this out. Let's agree not to say bad things about each other in front of the children. Mm -hmm. Let's keep this between us and, and the, the lawyers, the custody people. Yeah. A narcissist won't do that. He's just slinging arrows in, in mud. Claudia, would you, would you remind us, you know, a lot, I know a lot of attorneys and a lot of attorneys have this sense that they know everything, that they can do anything. They have a, an extreme amount of self-confidence. I've worked with surgeons who, you know, some people will say they, they put themselves up near God, that they can handle anything. But that's at one end of this continuum for narcissism, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, that kind of narcissism is anywhere from healthy. I want my surgeon to know that he can do anything and fix whatever's right. going on with me. Um, I don't want a surgeon who's got, gee, I don't know if I can deal with this. Right. Um, so, yes, and, and the kind of narcissism that we see there is, is maybe a narcissistic trait that's used when it's necessary to use it. Um, sociopathic narcissism is the kind of narcissism that we see in, in some politicians now where it doesn't matter what harm happens to the country, what harm happens to their own political party, what harm happens to a particular group of people, be they, be they, they black or elderly or, or whatever, as long as their um, motivations, their goals are accomplished. So it's a complete disregard for anybody else in order to get what you want. Right. And that's sociopathic. And sociopathic means it's against society. There's no, there's no promoting the betterment of all. It's just about me. And I think that there's a lot of that that's going on now. Um, when we talk about celebrities who tend to be narcissistic, full of themselves, my take on that um, is not they're not sociopaths, for sure. Um, they're probably quite insecure, as all narcissists are, and they have built a, a false front that prevents them from feeling so insecure. And that's sad, but it's not damaging society. Right. You know, we don't really care if somebody who is on the red carpet and just thinks she's all that. I mean, so what? It's kind of entertaining. Right. Um, but that's very different from, from sociopathic uh, narcissism. Um, I think that narcissism is, is enculturated in our, in our American society. I don't know that if it was intentional or malevolent, it's just how things happened. We came here um, as refugees from, from oppression, and what we ended up doing is oppressing other people. Right. And this was um, from this attitude that, that I've explained before about we're right. This is what's called American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. We are right. We are justified. We are righteous. And in so doing, we can enslave people. We can take away people's land and, and things like that. And then you have the whole Western culture, which whether it's 
accurate or not how it's been portrayed in, in movies and in books and on television is, you know, you just go in there and you shoot up the town. Right. You know, you just you just rob that stagecoach. So that's part of the American myth, and we're always kind of going, yeah, that's that's great. So getting what we want, getting ahead, um, moving forward, manifest destiny, all of that is really part of our cultural DNA. And it's been latent uh, for a lot of times. I mean, we can certainly point out examples where it's not latent. but. The last seven or eight years, this explosion of narcissism, sociopathic narcissism from the very top, has kind of given permission to all of these latent narcissists to say, yeah, I don't have to follow any rules. Right. I can bust into a store and steal whatever I want. And so, you know, because we ask ourselves, why is there so much of this? And I think it's because from the very top, with the advent of Trump as president, um, you know, do what you want, lie freely. And those who have been repressing that, be racist. All, those who have been repressing that are going, yeah, okay, we're going there. Right, right. I, you know, I remember when Trump was elected and watching, not watching the results until about 10 o'clock at night with my wife and then saying, what is going on here? And my wife said to me, is this, what's going to happen? And I remember wrongly predicting to her, there's only so much that the president can do to change a country. Okay. Uh, and now looking back, uh, there's been a huge change in the country in the type of politicians that are rising to the top uh, and the policies that they're, they're pursuing. Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's right. And I think most of us who didn't vote for Trump have the same feeling. What, what can he possibly do? There's so many things, laws that can be passed and all of that. Uh, but he changed the psyche. He changed the, the culture. He gave permission uh, for narcissism. And that has been, you know, tragic in my mind. Yeah. And so following up on this political discussion, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and ask you, what do you see coming forward in the 2024 presidential election? At this point, I have no idea what's coming. Do you have any idea, based on what you know about personalities, styles, and the way politicians have been changing themselves? Yeah, um, well, of course, I'm not a political pundit. Um, but what I think will happen and is happening is people are seeing the results of what's been unleashed. I think everybody's getting quite fatigued at the divisiveness and quite saddened by it. Uh, and I think we're going to see um, a, a return to what was it John McCain said, you know, regular business. That people will go back to, uh, to following rules and, uh, and democratic ideals. Of course, that's wishful thinking, but I, but I really do think it's true. This kind of chaos is upsetting to the human psyche. Yeah. There's very few people who enjoy this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And those people might have been out there on the Capitol steps. This is like food for them. Right. But most of us find it disturbing. You know, we want to live our lives. We don't want to be constantly worrying if somebody's going to uh, have an insurrection or, or cut off our social security right. or, or any of that. So I do see a return to normalcy. I, I don't know that I could say 2024, but I think we will move back to that because this is highly disturbing to human beings. Sure. Now, I, I, now I, I bet as a therapist for so many years, what you know about personality disorders uh, are you able to, when you meet a narcissist, whether it's out at the store or at a cocktail party or in your, your therapy room, what are the, the things that stand out to you that an ordinary person in our audience, like red flags, should go up? Yeah. So in the therapy room, um, what, I, what I want to talk about is reciprocity because I think reciprocity is a big giveaway. But in the therapy room, it's not reciprocal, right? You come in, you talk, I don't talk about myself. So. It's hard to judge in that way. But in a friendship, in a, in a relationship, in looking for a partner, reciprocity is a huge thing. And that's something that narcissists can't do. It's about you. It's about me. It's about exchange of ideas. It's no, not always just me talking, talking, talking. So if I'm having dinner with a friend of my husband's who I've just met, and he spends the whole time talking about himself and never once asks, so Claudia, how are you? What's up with you? 
mm, red flag goes up. Right. And and I think that's that's really uh, that's really the biggest one. You know, there's there's minor things, name dropping and and experience dropping and all of that, but that kind of folds itself into the person who's always talking about themselves and never having any interest because they have no empathy, right? They don't care how your life is going. Right. Um, they're only interested in what they have to say. So Claudia, uh, in the way you just described that you meet someone at dinner or at a cocktail party and red flags go off. Do you think our country is going to be able to start recognizing these narcissists, these uh, sociopathic narcissists, when they get up on the podium and they're running for, for public office? Yes. One of the things that happened when Trump was elected, even though it made me very upset and sad and worried, was that for, as somebody who's studied narcissism for all of my career, I thought, finally, this is going to be in front of the world and we're going to be able to see this and recognize it. So narcissism, I think, as you, as you have said, is now a very hot topic. There's, yeah. there's millions of articles and books and podcasts about narcissism. So it's no longer in the closet. We know what it is and we're going to be able to recognize it. Will we see narcissists on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the campaign trail? Absolutely, because they think they're right. Mm -hmm. They can't believe that anybody would doubt that they're right. And this is something that happens in, in couples to, to watch out for, that the narcissistic partner is always right. And they're incredulous when their partner says, but wait a minute, what about this? And the partner just won't have it. That's, that's something that's very uh, pervasive in the narcissist, this, this refusal or this inability to see that they don't have the right attitude or even the right facts. Facts don't necessarily matter. Right. So I think uh, both in politics and in our personal lives, we're becoming more cognizant of what the narcissist is and um, that there, there is a lot of help out there for particularly the uh, the abused and the survivors of narcissistic relationships, um, and and some help for the narcissists themselves. Although that science is uh, is fairly new, uh, what what's happening now with the research is that narcissists have to be dealt with very, and I, I've said this earlier in, in these podcasts, very concisely, very succinctly, very, very assuredly, and to stay out of the drama. And uh, hopefully some therapists will be trained to then uh, work with them that way. Unfortunately, when a therapist gets um, to be in a room with a narcissist, it's like I said before, it's, even, it's either in a couple or it's in prison. Right. Um, because they, they do break rules and wind up in jail sometimes. So, so yeah, but I, I do think that people are becoming so much more aware of what narcissism is, its effects, and I think we're going to see a return to uh, more normal behavior, which means basically a rejection of the narcissistic, particularly the sociopathic narcissistic uh, behaviors and points of view. So with this sort of change in American politics, that you and I both hope goes away. Has that affected how relationships uh, play out? And are you seeing it in your therapy room where more people are recognizing narcissism and then bringing their partners in to try and figure out either how do I fix this or how do I get out of it? Well, what we're seeing for sure is more uh, victims of narcissism showing up. Um, if I wanted to work 60 hours a week just doing clinical work, I could do that. There's right. that much demand from, from people who are ab abused by narcissists. Do I think it's been unleashed by the current political situation? You know, a narcissist is a narcissist. They're going to be a narcissist regardless of who's president or right. who's running con Congress. Um, I think, uh, you know, what's happening politically is not creating narcissists, it's kind of unleashing them. So whatever pullback they might have had in their relationships, if they look around and they see, you know, blatant sexism, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to say, yeah, sure, I'll go there. Right. But I don't think our political system is creating narcissists, it's unleashing the narcissism that has been the undercurrent of American society. Well, then at the very least, hopefully, people are taking what's going on in politics, applying it to their own lives, 
and, and realizing that they don't have to put up uh, with this sort of nonsense in relationships. Yeah, yeah, and, and because there's so much lying in politics, uh, we've all been sort of incredible, again, uh, incredulous at the, as this notion of lying when, wait a minute, that was just fact checked and it's, it's lies, lies, lies. And I think before all of this political upheaval, we tended to think people don't lie or they don't lie very much. And now that they're seeing it, you know, the wife, the husband is seeing it in the political world, they're going, wait a minute, my partner is lying to me and they're repeatedly lying to me. They're double downing on their lying, which is what they're seeing in the broader uh, societal world. Great. Thanks so much for all the insight you shared with us today and for spending time with us. Uh, now, I understand that you do psychotherapy sessions online. Can you let us know how people can find you? Uh, yes, my, my practice is fairly limited. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking, speaking like this, and, uh, and writing. But if you want to contact me, uh, I'm at uh, claudiasinemosiasmft.com. Great. All right, thanks again. We're going to close out our show today with some song lyrics, like we usually do. Today, I've chosen Mean by Taylor Swift. If you can relate, it's time to get out of that abusive dynamic and into a healthier one. A relationship where you can enjoy a partner who treats you well. Isn't that what you really deserve? <laughs> <laughs>